looks good and there we go welcome everybody to another episode of workflow wednesday this week we're joined by will gibbons uh he's a product oh i always forget to mute youtube there we go so i don't hear myself back again <laughs> so let's start over welcome everybody to workflow wednesday this week we're joined by will gibbons um he does 3d and uh, 3d rendering product design and and animation things like that sort of deal uh, so this is super cool. And we also have our lab's expert, uh, William George, here joining us as well. Uh, so, well, just in case um, anybody doesn't already know, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little background of uh, who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Houston. Appreciate it. So I have a background in product design, as you mentioned. So I went to school for industrial design, which any product that you would buy off the shelf or interact with, you know, someone's behind that design. So that's what I went to school to study. Um, after graduating, I got into the cycling industry. I really enjoyed that, but I missed the uh, kind of hands-on uh, designing of, of different objects and stuff. Um, and so what I did is I, I started freelancing and after doing that for a couple of years, I, I really found myself loving the rendering aspect of the freelance jobs that I would get. So anyone who needed their product or their idea visualized or rendered in a way that would explain the product before they actually would manufacture it or before they would have a prototype available, oh. they would hire me to do that. And I really enjoyed that process. So that was the rabbit hole I kind of dived or fell into, I guess, went down. And um, in doing that, I started kind of building these tutorials online or, or creating videos and stuff. And um, the software I was using, uh, Keyshot, which is made by Luxion, um, mm -hmm. they saw those videos and they were like, hey, we could use somebody to do some corporate training, like uh, oh, on-site training for designers and engineer teams and stuff. So I joined their team and I did that for three years, oh, um, cool. just did on-site trainings. And it was a little over a year ago that I left to start my own business offering a visualization, so rendering and animation full-time uh, for, you know, really anyone whose project and budget fits my skills and offerings. So, so that's kind of my little condensed background there, but that's, that's what brings me here today. That's really neat. Wow. Uh, does a lot of your work, uh, come from, uh, um, I suppose like pre-production? Yeah, good question. So in, in a lot of cases, there's kind of two buckets or categories where I would fit into somebody's uh, timeline or, or product development, it would be uh, one, like you said, pre-production. So when somebody needs to make a decision, they want to see how uh, certain colors might look, certain materials might look on a product. They want to see a photorealistic rendition of a 3D CAD model. Mm -hmm. um, they would maybe use somebody with my services. Uh, the other side or the other aspect of that is more for uh, consumer facing uh, commercial work, things that you would attribute more to uh, commercials, photography, photo shoots, videos, things like that. And I, I've kind, I was in the previous bucket where I was doing a lot of work with startups and companies working um, on visualizing their product before they had prototypes available, mm -hmm. so they could make internal design decisions and stuff. Uh, I'm now more on the other side of things, where it's more the high end kind of flashy visuals that you want once the product is um, done you want to be able to uh, share it in a way that's going to be captivating to your audience and things and that's more of where i'm what i'm doing now so it, it, someone with this skill set could fall into either category really depends on the relationships you have and where you like to be involved in that process i think oh, that's pretty cool right on I'm, I'm curious how much, uh, I saw you, you see like a lot of commercials or like that high end, like photography and, and visuals, how much of what uh, would you say of what we see is, I suppose, fake? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's fun. I, I, I remember being fairly surprised myself, um, when I realized that or when it was shared with me or, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say all of it for sure. Um, there's certain products that really lend themselves well to rendering or CGI. So computer generated imagery. And um, in most cases, it's gonna come down to um, really budget and what uh, what the, the goal of the company or um, the person 
is you know what they have in mind because for example if you have um a website and you need a bunch of diamond rings uh rendered you know and you want the big fancy you know high carat count rings um that could get expensive really fast and do you really want to trust somebody and hand them 20 million dollars worth of rings and say go shoot these and give them back when you're done right um you know so that and because it, you know that's a fairly easy thing to render um now on the other side of things you also might consider something like a car moving down a freeway almost all the automotive work you see really does tend to be cg um but then they'll mix in some some live action stuff as well, kind of depending on how easy it is to get to a certain set and things like that, what they want to show. Um, but with the, generally with larger scale items, it's a lot harder to photograph or render them. Um, one more example before I, you know, go off on a tangent here is uh, <laughs> things. Some things are hard to photograph. So I was actually working with a company that um, does a lot of manufacturing stuff with their metals. And a lot of their manufacturing uh, processes had different metals and finishes that were just hard to photograph. And they didn't want reflections of a photographer in the metal and all that stuff. Um, or in another case, large machinery, say you do CNC machines and you wanna photograph them in a certain way. Well, you need first of all, a really big photo booth if your product is <laughs> 12 by 12 feet, right? Yeah. Then you need to make sure that your lens is wide enough to capture that image, mm -hmm. but you don't want that crazy distortion. So if you want to shoot it with like a 200 millimeter lens, you need to be in such a huge space to shoot this or ph photograph it, it becomes really tough. Mm. So CGI, again, I'm kind of jumping ahead of here a little bit, but one of the things is it's not so much um, a battle of, you know, what's better, photos or renderings. Um, it, it, a lot of this comes down to practicality, what's more feasible, what's more budget friendly, or if it needs to happen very quickly. Okay. And and in that, when you get into that, it, that kind of drives when somebody would use live action photography versus renderings. But back to the original question, I think if you're talking, you know, what percentage is going to be fake? I, I it's more and more every day, but I'd say it's probably at least up to 50%, I would guess. Okay, okay. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm curious of some about some of the challenges that come with, because you mentioned like some, sometimes a product is super big or in an awkward position. Um, does, it, does that also come with challenges on the other side for visualizing these things? Like how do you know if something's awkward or big, how do you get the whole like, I guess, picture. Yeah. Yeah. No, great question. There's, and there's certainly a lot, luckily um, we have technology on our side and things have been, you know, rapidly developing. Um, I know when I, when I <clears throat> first, the first experience in 3d modeling and rendering I had, which is a little over, I'd say it's probably about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, even then I've seen, you know, obviously leaps and bounds there in, in, in development. Um, some of the challenges come from, uh, first of all, the number one that comes to my mind is, is you need to start with a, a, a data set, basically. So your 3D model is um, geometry. Imagine you've got, actually imagine building models, like a little kit that you would buy off a shelf, and it's got these little plastic parts. You're going to assemble those together. And then mm -hmm. Imagine the rendering aspect is like that paint uh, that you're going to put on to really make it bring it to life, I guess. So you have to start with a, a 3D model and that's going to come from, you know, a client, in my case, somebody who has developed this product in house um, okay. designers or engineers. And the first thing that I always notice is that the detail captured in a good engineering model is not necessarily the detail I need to make a model look realistic from a rendering aspect. So the first example being, you're never going to see things um, that naturally occur, like um, fillets, uh, very small chamfers, or oh. rounded edges. Mm -hmm. um, in the real world, nothing is like going to have a razor sharp edge. Sure. But in order for an edge to reflect light, it has to have surface area. Mm -hmm. If it has, if two planes come together and there's no surface area, you see no light reflected. You have just two planes reflecting light. Huh. And what what you're going to get is if you have a cube with no rounded edges, um, yes, it will look like a cube, but it's going to look 
uh, what everyone envisions, like like late '80s CGI, like early '90s super oh, fake. Sure, sure. Because those so, sharp edges, like they don't make sense. Yeah. So even if you take something um, like Tron, you know, like a small, um, yeah, like a small object. Like I have this like little like nail trimmer thing here, mm -hmm. and if I can get that to focus, it's it's got like these little edges where you know they're reflecting light because they have surface area and those little rounded edges and if that but th so the point is that in in manufacturing data you don't put that in those things happen in the real world typically because of a finishing process and you don't capture that detail in the model or it happens naturally so if you mm -hmm. bend a piece of sheet metal it's going to have a rounded edge uh, but if you model it you know depending on you know even just punching out with a die a piece of sheet metal it's going to mm -hmm. have that rounded edge and that's not going to be stuff that anyone's going to model into their data set so so points being um there's a lot of good stuff that um is going to be in a cad model uh usually done by somebody who's really good at uh their job but when it comes to me i need to quickly be able to kind of discard the stuff that's not so necessary and focus on quickly putting in what i need necessary to make the thing look well or look good um and that could be a like a fairly manual process mm -hmm. um sometimes certain software has little tools in there to automate some of those um the other things that are typically challenges are 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 like soft bodies materials that you know, uh, are not hard. So like you're, if you have, you know, any sort of fabrics or anything that's going to be added in, you know, um, a product is going to be manufactured, but then maybe there's like a piece that gets added, you know, these headphones are all plastic, but like the ear cup is like this mm. extra piece of fabric that's going to be like added in later. And these little cables that come out, like all the um, little cables and stuff, no one likes to model. Like I get to do that oh, <laughs> because neat. it's just, it's a pain in the butt sometimes. So. <laughs> But, um, but that's, you need to have those little things that bring life into the rendering, of course. Um, uh, how much time do you think you spend, like, of your whole project time, how much of it is just cleaning up things ahead of time before you can really get to work like that? Luckily, it's, for me so far, it's not been too bad. Um, uh, not too much. I'd say certainly less than 1% of the full projects that I, uh, that oh. I do. Um, in most cases, the very most common things that I run into is uh, separating bodies. So for example, if you have um, something like, trying to keep examples without giving actual, actual <laughs> examples, but um, so in a lot of um, manufacturing process, you may have a plastic body that has things that flex on it. Mm. And they're like separate buttons that you would push on an object or a keypad or something that would deform naturally. But in my software, when I go to render that, um, the body is going to move as a solid, rigid part, typically. Oh, sure. So what I'll do is I'll go behind the scenes, chop those up into pieces as I need them, and I can then now manipulate them as separate bodies. Uh, so they look from the outside like they're working the way they would, but I had to go in and break those apart. Um, so that's, that's a common one. Another one is if you're going to have backlit details, glowing lights, buttons, and things like that, where light's going to need to diffuse through an object or something mm -hmm. like that. There's tip, there's like little tricks that I may have to do in the model beforehand. And, and the last thing that's probably the most common as I do more animation is the actual structure, the scene tree of a CAD models, like, um, design history, uh, or sorry, how each part relates to one another, whether they're nested and whether there's like parent child relationships between them. That's something I often have to do if I know I'm going to do some sort of like waterfall exploded effect where parts move out one after another in this like really nice looking way. Um, I may need to go tweak something in the model's structure before I go in to render it or animate it because a little bit of work up front can save me a lot of manual labor down the road if I can copy and paste the same animation on 50 parts and have them move on their local axis instead of. So yeah, it gets it gets nerdy quickly, but like those are the things that like I now know it's like you want to be a couple steps ahead and try to know what you're going to run into so you don't have to go back and forth doing these things. Nice. So we have a few questions uh, coming in from cool. the audience. Um, 
So I'm going to kind of take these questions a little out of order because they reference other things you've been talking about. Um, Jeff125 on Twitch, he asks, um, referencing back to like the little details about the shapes and stuff. Do you see those details just by referencing similar items or is it kind of just a, f of a feel for it? Yeah, so I do. I love having um, physical samples on my desk. Like my best friend, the, the, one of the things you always find on my desk is like a digital caliper because um, I'm constantly like, um, maybe if I was really, really good at drawing when I went to art school and my proportional sense was a little bit better, I'd be good. But I'm always surprised by like how much, you know, getting down to within, you know, the right size, half a millimeter makes a big difference when you're working on tiny details. So, mm. um, I'm often measuring things when I can just for reference, you know, cables and, and various, uh, fillets and chamfers and stuff. But like, um, doing it so often you start to build a library of like um, these common numbers you go to all the time when you're adding these little details. So it is about a 50, 50, but I'd say always start with referencing the real world object. That's pretty cool. And then, um, so then there's another question uh, from Garrett on YouTube, open source versus free versus paid software. Uh, what do you use and why? And then also uh, how long does it take to learn the trade? That's a great, number of questions. Um, the first one, there's definitely pros and cons to paid versus open source software. Um, uh, so right now, currently the main tools that I use, um, I'm doing most of my CAD work in Fusion 360 for like solid body modeling and stuff like that. Um, if it is a soft body or if it's something a little softer or more organic, I am, I'm branching into Blender um, using that a bit too. Um, and then when it comes to rendering, I've done almost all my, I, I have done all my commercial work in Keyshot. I've been using them for 10 plus years. So it's, it's really hard to branch out when something is, you know, it, know it, know it so well. I mean, I, I, I taught it professionally for a number of years. So it's like, it's, it's ingrained in me. Um, that said, I'm, I'm always trying to like expand my tool set. Um, now benefits of the the paid versus open source um i think when you become a business um and this ties into some of philosophies i have and and more than just software but when you start operating as a business you're you need to constantly um limit your liabilities and one thing is having support or access to support which typically comes with paid software um I have spent a lot of time in frustration trying to learn software where there's poor documentation and poor customer service and no real good like user forums for. And it is just, it, it, it pretty much stops you in your tracks. It's really rough. Now, when you go with paid software, those things are typically in place, not just software, but like, um, you know, anytime you work with other professionals who are offering a service, you get that same type of benefit. And so, um, if you're trying to learn quickly, that can be helpful. Now, the the other argument there, as far as open source goes, as uh, Blender I, I alluded to, is definitely open source. There's great tools out there. One thing that's cool about open source software is it's likely to never disappear. Hmm. There's not a company that's going to come in and buy it and then bury it. And that's somebody who's like me, whose livelihood is dependent on software. The fact that it can evaporate overnight is scary. So open source is very stable in my mind for that. You've got a, a, a such a huge community of users who can kind of keep it going, so to speak. Um, you also have uh, tons and tons of documentation and learning content because of that. So I'm not going to say one is better than the other. I think if you if you can have kind of a foot in both buckets, uh, then, then you're really well off. Um, as far as learning, um, that's a tough one too. I think you can, I think if you can kind of do the the, the 80, 20 principle and kind of focus on like just getting enough, um, just learning enough to be dangerous, learning to do just enough so you can produce a project or get to some sort of, uh, result then because with software, they're, they're always developing. They're, they're, they're usually massive. You don't just say, I'm going to learn CGI. It's just, it's too big. You usually choose a small project. Um, you know, I've been, so, so I, I would, I would tell so, somebody who really wants to get into like a fairly professional level, like be prepared to work hard for a good five years before you're pretty comfortable offering like professional services. Um, but like, 
you can do a lot in that period of time. I think it's the same, the old adage, like people underestimate what they can do in a, uh, they overestimate what they can do in a week and underestimate what they can do in a year. And I mm -hmm. think it's about that like perpetual, uh, steady focused and not, not getting upset that you don't get those big wins like really quickly, you know? Sure. So sure. kind of long answers there. Sorry. No, but... no, no, it's good. It's good stuff. Um, I'm curious. So like say somebody was just starting out, what sort of project would they begin with? Like you're not just going to start rendering an exploded view of a camera or something. Sure. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and I've, it's easy to relate to this because I'm at this level. It's like, whenever I feel like, okay, I've got a, I've got, a tool as a software package down, like now I want to add another one to my, my set. I have to, I have to set aside my ego and say like, <laughs> I know this is an easy project in this software, but go back to shading the sphere and making it like look correct. Make sure that the, the, the way the light moves around the, the scene is correct. Like, um, you know, I think it's, it's nice to start with something, um, very, very, very simple, obviously. I think that one of the nicest ways, easiest ways is to start off with uh, following tutorials. We live in a day and age where there's no shortage of content to learn from. Sure. I'd say plow through 10 to 20 of those to the point of where you start seeing patterns. And when, when you're watching a tutorial and they're saying, okay, now we're going to, and you're two steps ahead of them because you kind of know what's coming, that's a good time to stop the tutorials, create a little self project, something that's like, within reach. It's like, I'm going to do a glass of water. It's going to look like this. It's going to be on just a black background. And I'm going to make sure the caustics, the little sparklies on my hand render out properly, all that stuff, make sure that I can get the refraction, uh, of each material properly. Like those are the little details that really kind of show that you're, um, you know, you're really, the, those are the things that you're going to need to be able to pick up on if you're going to provide a similar level of service at some point to somebody. Okay. Wow, that's but, so it's a simple subject matter, yeah. but pick apart every little detail and know why it's happening type thing. Huh. Um, when you mentioned like the, the little sparklies from the water, is any of that like automatic? Like you, can you just say like, okay, this area that's water and the light is over here or do you do a lot of that manually? Yeah, great question. So in most software, it's going to luckily these days. Um, so it is automatic in that you, uh, if your materials and your light is set up properly and the, um, the environment that you've created is physically accurate, then technically, yes, it will happen automatically. How it happens and how much labor goes into that is 100% dependent on the software. Hmm. Um, with a lot of tools, so most render engines uh, have moved to being what are called physically accurate and they use kind of a similar uh, shader model. Uh, what that means is the material um, that they use within the material that you would, uh, sorry, within the software that you would apply to an object, it's got all these properties that you can set the values for, and they're all going to behave fairly similarly. And when you give it the right conditions um, and you tell the render engine to render that type of light transmission, in this case, fo focused caustics, um, it should be able to do it. It's not like you're airbrushing it in, you're not telling it where to go, it will end up in the right spot, it'll be the right brightness. But you still have to know a little bit about the conditions under which uh, the conditions that need to be met under which that happens in real life. So a lot of things like what I tell people too, when they're interested in this is, if you um, focus on learning photography basics, a lot of those are going to transfer into the software the same principles of where and how light behaves, uh, certain materials, reflections, things like that. Uh, luckily, software is now so artist friendly, as opposed to 15 years ago, um, <laughs> they're emulating the real life. So, so you can take that creative vision and just kind of uh, achieve it fairly easily within the software. Right on. I'm going to take a moment and try and fiddle with my mic for just a moment. William, if you would. Uh, uh... Oh. <laughs> Sure. Well, so there's a, there's another question, same gentleman that had that, uh, the last one there. Um, how often do you feel stuck when your idea and reality just won't come together for a project? And then how do you deal with that? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I like it because it doesn't have a, a right answer. <laughs> um, man, so there's definitely been times in the past where I kind of thought 
something was going to look cool or work out or be interesting. And then when I tried to implement it, um, it didn't work out. I'd say that's, that's, I think that's um, something that you run into a lot fairly early on into the journey. Um, again, I started this in, so my, I graduated college in 2011. So we're coming up on almost a decade. And so, and so that was, that was me for four years. Every, every day in college was that it was uh, trying to sift through ideas, figure out which ones were worth pursuing and then which ones panned out. Um, you know, nowadays, luckily I'm working with uh, companies that have already done the work up front to uh, validate their ideas and, ex and executing on that is not typically as much a challenge for me now. It's more of the whole thing of like, is a project gonna be a home run or not? You know, and that comes down to like, how satisfied are you with the results? Does it meet that, does it have that wow factor? And it's just like playing the lottery for me because I, I don't have a super long career, but I know some people who are more prolific find that formula fairly early on. So I'd say if that is something you're running into, the best way to combat it is volume. The more you can create, the more you're gonna have home runs basically. Nice. And so I'm kind of curious about, um, as you mentioned how it's a lot like photography, you know, you're sort of trying to do the same thing, just digitally, artificially, instead of photographing something physically. And you also mentioned something I've run into with my own stuff, uh, how difficult some materials can be to photograph. Do you find that there are some materials or certain shapes of objects that when you're doing rendering, are a struggle to get looking right, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. So for me, luckily, most of the work that I <clears throat> have done and the type of work that I do, um, they're, they're typically a, a, a fairly common product. So it's got some form of electronics that are housed in, in some sort of, um, you know, body or shape that's, that's you know, and, and those are all made up of fairly similar shapes, whether they're boxes or cylinders or things like that. Um, so luckily, I'm not dealing with the hardest stuff uh, there. I think characters and like fit like people and stuff can be hard too, and, and all that stuff, more organic stuff. Um, for me specifically, the more, I guess the more challenging stuff is trying to make something interesting when it's a box. I think that's what a lot of companies or people run into and they're like, yeah, you know, we've got a box. How do we make it look cool type thing? Um, and there I kind of pull from like my own, ex you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling like, oh, the challenge is that the product's just not that interesting and we need to inject some life into it. I like to try to pull inspiration from really creative photographers who have their own tips and tricks. Um, I don't want to start name dropping because a, I don't, I don't know a ton of them, but B, <laughs> I like to look at people who do, you know, everything from like nightlife photography or um fashion photography i really like to I, I've, I've enjoyed looking in a fashion industry because you got again i'm not a big fashion guy but like you could take a piece of fat like to me a shirt's a shirt's a shirt it's like it's fabric great but like fashion photography is not about the article it's about like the emotion and that mm. kind of that feel that you're capturing mm. so whether it's luxury goods or fashion or uh, film for like entertainment. Those are my big three sources of, of inspiration that I like to pull style frames from or photos or stills and use that as a jumping board. And from there, depending on how liberal or open-minded the client is, we can push that, punch it up, use things like color and shadow for composition and more gradients on surfaces and stuff. Um, so for me, again, it's, it's, Difficult materials. Um, thankfully, I haven't had too many crazy ones. Right now, it's the super soft, super translucent silicone type materials. Mm. And again, that comes down more to, I think, sometimes some render engines knock some stuff out of the park. Others struggle with some stuff. Mm. And for me, one of the challenges I had more recently was backlit silicone buttons. So you've got an LED, you've got a silicone button on top of it, and the silicone when the button is not lit is very milky, but it's still mm. a little bit transparent. So you actually can see through it a little bit, 
um, so it doesn't look super solid and it's super rough on the, on the surface finish. So you're not going to get any specular reflections anyway. So the whole thing is just going to look flat almost no matter what huh. and kind of not so pretty. And then when it gets back lit, it needs to have the right light distribution through the object and everything. And balancing that when you start animating it and it has to animate between those two phases becomes mm. a super challenge. So for me, it's more to do with balancing materials that have to change over time alongside animating lights and not overexposing because maybe you have a shiny plastic or metal right next to it. That's like the worst case ever. <laughs> two materials are the opposite and they're next to each other. And you know, light one, someone's like, well, why does this look all white? I'm like, because that's what it's going to happen. Like, we don't like that. Yeah. It's a comp like CGI. Why don't you fix it? I'm like, oh no. So yeah, it's, it's sometimes, I think the biggest challenges are um, fulfilling creative briefs and then also trying you know, to, um, you know, you want to obey the laws of physics and make things realistic, but you also need to, uh, at the end of the day, deliver what the client's asking for. I think mm -hmm. for me, those are some of the bigger challenges as opposed to specific forms and materials. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine it's got to be a bit of a, a challenge to be where, like you were saying, like the reality of the thing is probably not going to be what you see in the final like commercial product i suppose you know the the shot in the magazine photo is not it's like the like advertising hamburgers right that's not what you're going right. to get you know yep. but it, but it, that's the ideal that they yes. want to get across and so that's got to be tough when the the rendering software is trying to be physically accurate this mm -hmm. is really what it's going to be like but the marketing guy is like no it needs to look shinier and pretty and yeah, that's got to be. And that, that is that is absolutely again some some groups or some um, experiences I've had uh, that's more present than than others. But but that struggle or that kind of tug of war that you mentioned, it's it's ever present. It's always going to be the thing. You know, how much of the creative vision versus how much of the real life do you want? You know, and that's luckily if you're if if you know the tool and if the tool is fairly flexible, then luckily that's up for debate and you can you can go in either direction. Right on. Um, oh, I just, I had a question about, oh, about like the, like the hardware or the, the tools that you use, like what all goes into, I mean, there's obviously like the computer part, but like what else surrounds your work? Sure. Um, for me, luckily most of it's done inside a box that, you know, houses all the goodies, but, um, but for me, because because in, in my case, I'm not typically having to take reference photos or anything like that. Oftentimes, I'm getting supplied with imagery of the product and stuff. So um, I don't I don't need like a, a photo studio or a certain special camera or anything. I'm not capturing live action footage uh, that then needs to I have to composite things onto. When that if that's the case, then you you have a lot of extra hardware, camera stuff, and rigs that you need to worry about lighting and stuff. But Luckily, what I do can be done from pretty much a laptop or a computer, no matter what. Um, cool. As far as my own setup, just creature comforts go, I have one monitor. I'm, I'm a one monitor guy. I don't like two. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, I got the ultra wide 34 inch. Um, and yep. <laughs> I, I love that. I've the rock in the same Dell monitor for like six or eight years now or whatever. But what I found is actually, this is a bit of a tangent, but what I found is this is kind of fun. When I do my my YouTube tutorials and, and recordings and stuff like that, um, I, I didn't know what to do because I needed to be able to capture full screen my software, but I'm on this one monitor and like, do I need to, most people just dedicate two monitors to like capture the screen here. But then, so what I do is I use a lovely little software called, um, oh, what is it called? It's a uh, Sizer for Windows. And um, all I have to do is basically hover my mouse over a screen and I like hit a hotkey and it pops it into a 16 by nine aspect ratio sheer to the left of my monitor. So as big as the application will go, so that's like 1440p. And then, and then I have this like sliver of like real estate on the right hand side. That's like my dashboard, all my notes and everything. And my, my OBS goes there and everything. So like the two stay separate just on one monitor. Um, well, that's cool. So that's like a, that's like a, took me a while to figure that out, but um, works well. Um, other than that, 
just standard bookshelf monitors, a um, couple, couple of lights clamped to my desk for my face. And then um, I do have one thing that's unique is my desk is a stand up desk, sit stand desk. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm at the computer all the time. I have to be able to stand up. So I'm not getting like my back's not aching all the time and stuff. And having two PCs that I use, I've got a camera mounted here. I've got, uh, I've got a lot of stuff going on, but in order for that to work with a sit stand desk, I've got an obscene amount of cable management and devices wired on, uh, to the underside of my desk. Oh, and, wow. um, and then I've got a small rack for my audio gear off to the side. That's like, I don't know, 24 inches tall. And both my PCs stand on top of that and all my audio gear is underneath it. So, wow. so it's fairly streamlined, but it's, it's like been this control center that's evolved over the past, I don't know, five years or something like that to get it to where it works well. Neat. I'm in a weird transitionary state myself of there's a new office, new desk and stuff, and I'm still trying to figure out where everything's going to go to make sense. So it's fun. It's, yeah. A, a little fun, frustrating kind of, cause it's like, yes. where did I put that <laughs> thing and why can't I go over there? And so it, it's a, I can, I understand how it can, it like evolves over time. It's, it's rough. Um, let's see. Oh, we have another question from YouTube Garrett. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Um, so being at it for so long, do you sometimes find yourself overcomplicating it just to stay challenged and then have the aha moment when you realize it could actually be very simple? Yeah, that's a funny question. Um, I, I was just coincidentally thinking about this, uh, earlier today. Um, so, um, in a lot of rendering tools, <clears throat> you can use what's called HDRI lighting or image-based lighting, which is just um, a spherical image of a high dynamic range. Yeah, we're throwing out all sort of $5 Ooh. words here. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, an image that has a ton of light data, more than can be displayed on screen at once, and that's going to create um, your little highlights and things on your model. That's the beginner style of lighting for the most case, uh, for most modern software is where it's, it's quick and easy to get into and it just looks cool. It looks good. But when you get into more, uh, needing more control over it and you want certain, uh, more realistic, uh, shadows and fall off and thing and highlights and stuff, you start using what's called physical lights. You use an actual object that emits a certain type of light and, and you move those around just like a, a photographer in a studio would mm -hmm. way more time consuming to set up. You're fiddling with settings all the time, but like, it's, it's kind of like, once you go there, once you go that way, you never go back to, or I, I found with myself, it's like, once I went with physical based lighting, I kind of like never went back to HDRI, HDRI lighting, but sometimes an HDRI will just look great. And it's just like one second, click, apply it, done. Don't need to touch it anymore. So yeah, there is plenty of time where I overcomplicate things uh, and I don't need to, um, I don't do it purposely. Trust me. I, I, if I could work only three hours a day, I would, but <laughs> it doesn't seem to be possible. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, there was another question earlier too. Um, does photogrammetry play? Is that a thing that works within your workflow? That's an interesting question. So not yet uh, for me, and and I definitely think it's it's a very very interesting space. I have so I'm not big into the AR VR world. Um, I don't own any uh, VR stuff. I've I've I put on a headset once, but um, and I think it it's it. it I don't know. It's not a big, it's just not something I'm personally interested in until it's really matured. Then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go in and I'll have some catching up to do for sure. And photogrammetry is kind of the same thing as we're getting into, um, AR and VR. I know a lot of those assets in some cases are starting to be captured with anything from a smartphone device or sorry, like a smart device or a camera or something. Um, it can save a phenomenal amount of time. And I've seen some creators doing some amazing stuff with it. For me personally, um, I exist in the world of um, product visualization. So I'm not working with as many of the tools uh, that people in the entertainment industry are. So people who are working on things that are going to broadcast TV or film or shows, things like that, their tool set differs from mine quite a bit. Mostly I'm working with uh, people who are uh, producing physical goods. Mm -hmm. So the software I have is very much optimized for that which means it's also not very well optimized for photogrammetry oh. uh, or, or that type of captured data. Um, that said, uh, if I needed a fairly elaborate um, set that's more organic uh, and not 
something someone's going to produce, but you know, you want to go out and capture a, I don't know, a stump because you want to render a, a cool coffee, something more organic, like a Chemex on like a cool natural looking setting or something. That would be a fantastic way to do it. But for me personally, in that case, I'm going to just go buy that asset. There's lovely mm -hmm. marketplaces with tons of really robust assets. I love to go and uh, buy those when we need to, because again, it's, it's all about fulfilling the creative vision without burning yourself out getting there. You know, it's like with, with the artists, we typically tie so much of our ego into uh, the work we produce. Um, I make jokes. I'm like, I always say I should have been a plumber because I'm like the stress level, I feel like would be low. It's like, you know, you fix a pipe or you don't. And that, that's kind of, and I'm sure that it's more nuanced. Than that. I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers no matter what, but like, I have all this like existential, like stress tied up into like what I do, you know, but there's always like, you, there's part of me that wants to create every part of the project. And then there's the other side of me, it goes, you know, like you didn't make your computer and you're not upset with that. Like, you know, does the baker get made fun of? Cause he didn't go make the flour that he's baking with. Like to what extent do you need to do everything from scratch? Sure. And there's this big transitional period where you kind of have to mature in your craft in this space, I think, where you have to go, once you know how to do it, you need to say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm working and, and hired for my vision and fulfilling this need. It's my job to do this efficiently and not just toil. I don't need to be the tortured artist, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting back and forth there. And if you think about it also, just on the photogrammetry side of things, it's almost exactly the opposite of rendering rendering you're taking an artificial 3D digital model and trying to make it look as real as possible, usually. Photogrammetry, you're taking a real object or place, digitizing it and trying to make a 3D model. Mm -hmm. So they're basically the exact opposite pathways. Kind of interesting. It is, yeah, very. Um, man, Garrett, I feel like Garrett ought to be sitting in my chair right now. He has more questions and and I'm loving it though. He says, um, uh, has anything you have ever done had a bigger reach than you originally expected? Um, if so, did it motivate or scare you? Yeah. I think Garrett needs to get his own show. Yeah. Right. Um, good <laughs> questions. Good questions. No. Um, let's see. Bigger reach than expected. I mean, there's a couple there. Um, one I'll refer to as just a, a personal project of mine. I, you know, uh, having a product design background, whenever I would um, fly like on airplanes, I, I, I lived in airplanes basically and, and hotels and, and stuff when I did the onsite uh, training because mm. I was just on the road a lot. So <clears throat> when I would get ideas, I would kind of jot them down and then I'd fill whatever little bit of time, like, oh, I got a little time tonight at the hotel or I'm waiting in the airport lounge, like try to c bring this design to something. I'd quickly, how quickly can I model it and render it just quick and dirty as fast as possible some of those projects turn out to be actually most of them turn out to be duds but every once in a while something would work out and there was a lamp design that i did mm. i don't know i think i published it earlier this year like january or something like that and that that was what much more well received than i expected it to be and it was just a fairly simple concept that i just kind of knocked out yeah um other than that, I, I got lucky in one of my earlier client gigs was some rendering work for Peloton, who's known well in the um, exercise at home space. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, seeing some of my work um, out there uh, all over the place for a while was really fun. So both of those were nice and exciting and I'd say far more motivating and not scary, just like a good reminder to be like, oh, yeah, like you can, you know, stuff you can, you do can go, you know, you, you just have to be, you have to stay up on top of your craft and just, you, you have to be there for the opportunity type thing, I think. Yeah. One thing I was kind of curious about, um, just because you've been using Keyshot for so long, you'd said, was um, I know recently for years and years, they were uh, CPU based rendering. Mm -hmm. Uh, but just recently, I think in the last version, within the last year or two, they made the jump to also supporting GPU-based stuff. Did you see an, an impact from that in terms of like your workflow? Did that change how you had to do anything or did it just speed things up or what? Great question. And, and you're dead on. They very much had 
built their identity on um, being a CPU based render engine. And um, I know early on that gave them some great advantages as far as what they could calculate and, and things like that. So when, when we saw a whole bunch of uh, very big, I guess, leaps and bounds in the GPU market and how that worked as, uh, for, for rendering and potentially ray tracing, that was super interesting. Now, I'm not the best spokesperson for GPU at the moment, just because I haven't, I haven't made that transition myself. Hmm, so wow. it has not at all affected my work uh, flow um, yet. I expect it to, but um, just as you would expect with any software, when they undergo a new feature or a new version, there's always a little bit of like, you do your absolute best to polish it off, but at some point you have to release it to the public. And then when it is public or in the public hands, um, more things will be discovered that could not have been uncovered in the, uh, sorry, the Q and a process right. in the testing yeah. process. And so unfortunately, as much as I love to play with new features, when you are a service provider who needs to provide very th things like, um, accurate color matching and support legacy files. If a client's worked with you for a number of years and they want you to pull up an old file and have it look exactly, if mm. anything changes down to the pixel, uh, you can be on the line for that. So you, there needs to be these kind of fail safes. And this is one, this is not a Keisha thing. This is every software developer out there. They're always on the line for this um, because they need to be able to provide consistent results. And so for me, knowing that it was still a new feature with some um, things that needed to be fully realized into that system, um, I just said, I'll sit tight. I'll, I'll watch other people really figure it out. And, you know, that said, I've got plenty of friends who are like, you know, rubbing in my face how quickly their animations <laughs> rendered. And I'm still, I'm still holding tight to CPU. And because um, I have quite a bit of uh, render power here and and I, I'm good buddies with um, some people have a render farm who I, who I like to use too. So I think, I think in another year, if you were to ask me that question, I'd probably have a different answer. So yeah, it's interesting for sure. Yeah. Out of curiosity, what sort of, you said you have a lot of render stuff there. I hadn't even pulled up what, uh, what you're using, but what sort of CPU is it? Uh, do you know? It is the, so I've been a little bit bad at staying on top of the nomenclature. I have the latest uh, 64 thread AMD. Predator. Nice. Predator, yeah. So yeah, I had. Okay. That is as much horsepower as you can get pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> the CPU side of things. Very so, cool. Yeah. It's, uh, so I had the, yeah. So I had the, and I've been in AMD's camp for a few years. So when they first released the, the, the first, Gen Threadripper, I got the 16 core version, which was unbelievable at that time for, for me. And, yeah. um, and then later I upgraded that to the 32 core version of that. Um, and then I am still on the 32 core version, but the third gen version of that mm -hmm. Threadripper now, which um, same core count, but like leaps and bounds faster, unbelievable. So I have one machine here that's got the, the second gen 30, two core Threadripper and then the third gen from the one that you guys built for me. And it's, it's just been, it's been awesome. Love it. Nice. I'm curious in a similar vein to, I mean, the software has kind of changed. Is there anything in particular um, that you're excited about in the future, like coming down the line, any change, any, anything like that? As far as hardware goes or um, software? Or either way, just like kind of, um, What's, what's coming that you're most like excited about in your field of view, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, so I, I kind of, for me, um, I've got a pretty ridiculous home setup for, for compared to some of my friends who work from home. Um, and, and this just happened this, this year. So within the past couple of months, like I've got, I'm set. So I put a lot of time and effort into kind of upgrading what I had here. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll probably sit tight for like, my setup's not likely to change for a while just because I'm in a good spot with it. Um, <clears throat> that said, anytime there's more power for the same price or, or something like that, I mean, that's cool. Um, I've got, so right now I've got the two machines and then I use a NAS device to keep them synced up. Mm -hmm. um, the NAS does all the syncing. 
and uh, backing everything up. And both machines have the same hard drive configuration, the same three hard drives in each one, and they're both synced locally. So every time I make an a, a update on one, it pushes the update to the NAS, and that pushes that That's updates cool. what's at the other computer that will then be out of date. So there's parity, or they stay synced up all yeah. the time, and it takes just a second for them to sync. And you know, I hit a little KVM switch to pop between both machines. My my input devices don't change. Like it's super super seamless. And this is something I've wanted for years and years and years, and it's finally like a reality. So for me. I'm still nerding out about this whole setup, like the multi PC setup. I think eventually what it is, is if I were to be like, I would love to have like my own, like little cool, like server room where I have, you know, a couple of machines racked up and I could build virtual machines from those. So it's the same result of what I have here, but it's a little bit more uh, virtualized, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and, and customizable and, and, and then the fact that I can take my laptop and be somewhere else and, and utilize all this is just incredible. Um, and I think, I think it's, I think it's, that's what I'm excited about is just the fact that what used to only be in like a business that could throw a million dollars at a setup is now re a reality for a small business owner. So I can be anywhere and I can still work on, you know, I, I think down the road as I, as the software gets more advanced and I expand my skill set, it's going to be doing the same stuff, but like, rendering out full animations mm. and not having to go to a render farm or, um, you know, uh, baking out full simulations to do much more advanced animations for things that are far more organic or whatever. Um, you know, I think that's, that's probably, that's probably it for me is just like, I love the hardware aspect. I'm not an IT guy, but like, I love that I can have the power and then that can help me get the visuals out faster. All right. Yeah, cool. I like to hear that. That's cool. Cause like, that's kind of our part of that's our job is to worry about the, the, that side of it. As long as you're able to do what you do, easier and faster and just yeah, that's cool. That that, I mean, it makes me feel like we're doing our job right. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> you know, absolutely. You, um, John actually, he's in the chat. He, he he picked up on on the line you said about like I don't really keep up with the technology. Um, you know, it's not that's not what you need to focus on. So that's really cool. That's, it, it makes me feel good. Uh, <laughs> um, we have a, a question actually from Twitch. Um, cool. I'm not really sure. Ashiok Nightmare Moose is their name. That's a, that's a rad name. <laughs> how much autom <laughs> oh, okay. uh, How much automation do you include in your workflow? <laughs> like Python scripting uh, in or outside Blender, Mel and Maya, PowerShell? Yeah, cool questions. So the answer I wish I could provide was all sorts. The answer I have to provide is none. <laughs> oh, okay. I do. I do no scripting uh, yet. I. Um, so again, I've uh, the beauty of Keyshot and and why it was so attainable was that it's it's very much a drag and drop, easy, unintimidating. Um, it's probably the fastest three D uh, rendering application you could learn, um, and that's what brought me into this world, and. Um, as I've kind of dipped my toe into some other software, I've understood the importance scripting plays in these other tools. For example, um, I've moved into uh, Resolve for doing all my, that's the last step of any of my animations make uh, okay. before I push them out. So I'm, I'm not using Premiere Pro or After Effects really anymore. I'm, I'm, I love the Blackmagic design tools and Fusion is part of that for compositing. And as I'm learning more about that tool, it's all node-based and people who make tutorials are like, we're going to make our own tool for this. Just use this script and stuff. I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> so like, it's like the thing where I'm like, yeah, I should have studied math in school. Right. Um, but at the, at the same time, so I'm also playing around with Houdini again, not because I'm any sort of wizard, but because they've made that tool again, very attainable. And there is a lot of great learning content for it. And, you unlock the power of it by using um, a computer that can do many processes instead of you manually doing the same thing over and over. And you do so by conditional uh, sort of scripts where you're giving you know a fairly complex set of uh, instructions and some parameters that say, go to town, go do this thing. Um, I love that. I, I do have a technical side that just absolutely loves it to pieces, but I don't know it yet. I am very much in the process of, of just 
breaking into that world, but um, if Dark Moose Nightmare, whatever, uh, has <laughs> suggestions on on how to how to get educated on that, I'm all ears. Yeah, right on. Um, let's see. How uh, here's another one from Garrett, but I'm, I was curious about this myself. Like, how much work do you do for clients, and then how much time do you have to kind of play with your own ideas? Yeah. So right now. Uh, there, so my business is pretty, uh, pretty young, um, just over a year old. And that means that my backlog of repeat work, um, hasn't led to me being fully booked year round yet. Uh, of course, right now I'm in a spot where I'm, I'm definitely booked out for, for the next few months, fortunately, but what'll happen inevitably is there's still these lulls between when a client gets you all the assets that you need to start going. Like I can, I can spit out a contract overnight, but if they're a big corporation and they need to go source data from all the right departments who have their other fires burning at that moment, my stuff gets pushed back a week or two. So I have to be ready to fill in those spots. So to me, the client gigs are the bricks and the mortar is are all my personal projects. And that's what fills in all the cracks. And, um, Sometimes I'm slammed for three weeks straight. Sometimes it's three months and fairly chill. Hmm. Uh, personally for me, um, I stay very, I, I take on way too much. I try to publish YouTube videos um, every, you know, as much as I can, at least every week if I can. Um, I've got personal, I just pushed out a personal project, I think yesterday or last night, um, that's been kicking around for 14 months on my hard drive. I'm working on another one right now. so it's almost like a sprint. When I get a downtime between client gigs, I'm like sprinting to take the, the half-baked personal project that's on my hard drive, dust it off, clean it up, get it published, get it out. And um, so it's a lot. I'm, I, I stay pretty busy. Um, I don't have kids um, and my better half works in the medical field and, and is often at work. And so I have a lot of time to fill doing this type of stuff. Well, that's good. I mean, at least you're keeping busy. How much, mm -hmm. um, how much time is is of that is like education too? Like learning, is there a lot to is there a lot still to learn? Like at at your level of professional? Yeah, so there's there's always I, I it's definitely that graph you've seen where there's like plateaus where it kind of jags up. So it's like you get something new, <clears throat> and then you're like an example I used earlier is like oh you learned about how to use physical lights instead of just the default HDRI. So like you're like drinking from a fire hose and your work goes up much better. And then as you, you know, once you've kind of all your work is like now at that next level, you're kind of plateaued for a bit, but then you watch a video by a photographer on how to photograph cutlery. And then all of a sudden you use one of his techniques and then you spike up again because you're, you're, you get in. So all these little tricks that you pick up along the way, they elevate your work, but there's definitely plateaus between those. And, I think for that growth, you need to spend a lot of time looking for those opportunities um, with, and I'm, I'm just learning to kind of insist that I get some of this time on client work in this last uh, project I recently wrapped up. Um, I spent some time doing R and D up front where I was trying to kind of take some metaphors or some, some deeper meaning from what they asked of me and then try to create visual examples of ways I could inject that into the work. And then I, I downloaded different tools and I tried extracting code from different software and injecting it into some other stuff and messing with data and, and hiding little things here and there to try to elevate this. And, and that only comes from that a watching tutorials on how to do something you didn't know before and b forcing yourself to make the time to implement that new skill. Um, so for me, even though I'm, I, I know the software I use all the time, quite a bit, it's either a lot of time spent learning new software or trying to come up with a weird or a different way to use the software. I know the last example I'll give is I wanted to, a uh, recent piece that went up, um, I did, there was lights. Um, I wanted to have the lights in my render engine flashing to some music to, uh, that was an integral part because this was for a, a promotional piece for a new synthesizer that a company makes. And so I took the, the artist's music, converted the amplitude of the music into keyframes, and then had used those to drive 
white and black values to create a video map. And I use that video map inside my render software to control the brightness of the lights and stuff. And then when I was done, I also ended up reusing those assets I made to control blending layer, blending modes within my NLE, nonlinear editing, like video software to get various effects. So like, that's not something I'd seen done with the tools I use specifically. I'm sure someone has, but it, it took me looking at a different software and, and using it slightly differently to find, to unlock a new discovery. So that's I think that that's super important because that's where you see some real growth and that's where you feel it's, uh, that's a win that you can then say, okay, that, that had a lot of return for the time I put into that. I need to do more of that discovery type stuff. Oh, neat. That, yeah. I love, I love creative solutions. Like that, that's super cool. Like what a, uh, an interesting way to combine a lot of different tools and stuff to, to get where you were trying to go. That was really neat. Um, Right on. Uh, so we're we are a little over our hour. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a, oh, a little bit a little bit of time for any last questions. Um, if, if the audience or William, if you have anything you'd like to ask as well. Um, but uh, yeah, somebody on Twitch is asking which artist, what synth company. Ha ha. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll we'll give just another little bit to any final questions or or will if there's anything you'd like to mention or shout out anything anything you'd want like to say as we wrap it up give you a chance to plug your youtube channel and stuff too here like mm -hmm. uh where, where can people cool. find you if they want to hear more yeah so i'm most active on uh <clears throat> youtube and instagram so youtube it's uh youtube.com slash will gibbons and uh my instagram handle is at will gibbons design and um cool. i'm pretty visible in both places but uh yeah i appreciate it and i appreciate you guys too uh this has been fun um i people who follow my story and, and my channel and stuff know that um that I've, I've been using your hardware for a few months now and i've been super super happy with it it's been a lot of fun and it's it's afforded me the ability to um work seamlessly between two workstations which again i, I expressed that that i was really interested in that prior to this experience and it's it's i didn't realize ahead of time how like now I'm never going back to less than two machines because I can have one running all the time. And as soon as I am like, oh, I need to do this thing, but this machine's busy, I hit a button and I'm on the next one. And it's just, it's really kind of unlocked uh, my ability to output uh, more work, which always makes my clients awesome. happier. So yeah, yeah really appreciate it. also afford you a built-in backup. Like if something did ever happen to one of the systems, you just keep going on the other one while it gets fixed. That's pretty cool. And that, that very much, that kind of plug and play aspect is something I, I want to continue. It's like, if something goes wrong, yeah, you can replace something, pop it in. It's almost like swapping a hard drive on a redundant uh, array on your yeah. NAS. But yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, definitely, guys. Really fun chatting with you guys yeah. and getting to nerd out for a little bit. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time out of the day um, for and, and kind of giving us a little insight into how you do what you do. This is this has been really cool. I, I was especially surprised um, the crossover with photography and, and how much that affects kind of the other side of uh, or the, the 3D rendering and the animation part of it. That's really that's pretty cool. So thank you. Thank you again for, for taking the time. And um, William, as well, thank you for taking time and joining us. And the audience, as well, for joining us today. Uh, we do this every Wednesday and Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Wednesday, we bring on industry experts like Will Gibbons here. And on Fridays, we have our labs uh, experts come in and um, just kind of try and give you guys a little peek behind the curtain, answer questions, and provide some value to you guys. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>